Well, welcome everyone uh, to discussions in neuroophthalmic disease rules, exceptions to the rules and exceptions to the exceptions to the rules. Tonight, we're gonna have my partner here, uh, Dr. Joe Salka uh, doing this presentation. Uh, I think most of you know Joe, but he definitely deserves an introduction here. Joe served as the professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years, and I think he always says two days. days. Here he served as the Chief of Advanced Care Service, the Director of Glaucoma Service, and the Chair of the Department of Optometric Sciences. Joe is also a founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. He didn't stop there. He's also a founding member of the Optometric Retina Society. He, did he is the Chair of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry for the American Academy of Optometry. Uh, you'll see tonight that Joe is a gifted speaker and teacher, but he's also a gifted writer with hundreds of published articles, and he's the lead author of the annual Handbook of uh, Ocular Disease Management by Review of Optometry. Uh, Joe has recently transitioned from the school to Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. Everyone, please give Joe a virtual round of applause. Joe, it's all yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Greg. I'm happy to be here. It's great to be here, or as Keith Richards says, it's great to be anywhere. And we're going to talk about neuroophthalmic disease. And uh, what I'm hoping to do, and, and Greg is great going morning. to is going to uh, probably uh, interact with me and talk a little bit as we as we are doing this. So, Greg, don't don't uh, don't hesitate to share a thought here. What I want to do is share a few pearls in neuroophthalmic disease. You know, there are certain rules. That if we follow, it's really going to be very helpful to us uh, in, in managing patients with neuroophthalmic disease. I can tell you in my practice now, which is a large medical surgical practice, I'm, I'm doing most of the neuroophthalmic disease. And uh, I see how, how it can go well, how it can go wrong. And really what I'm doing is just try to share with you a few good clinical pearls. Now, here are, my, here are my consultancies. I'm a consultant or speakers bureau advisory board member within the last 12 months for advices, uh, Zeiss and Bausch and Loam. I've got no financial interest in any products that we may talk about. In fact, there's really no financial interest in neuroatomic disease uh, at all. I did create this presentation myself through my experience uh, and, and teachings. And I'm also a co-owner with Greg of Ophthalmic Education Consultants, where you all find yourself tonight. Now, everybody has a lot of uh, philosophies about uh, neuroophthalmic disease. Thurston Howell III doesn't like neuro. For him, neuro equals referral or diagnose and adios. And for those of you, know, some, I'm sure some people may, may recognize this reference, uh, Thurston Howell III from Gilligan's Island. I had an opportunity some time ago to casually catch an episode and realized it was really a terrible, uh, terrible show. Now, managing patients with neuroophthalmic disease, you, you know, we need a, a certain understanding of anatomy, which we all learned in school. But there are several fundamental principles and a few rules that if you follow them, you're going to be able to, to manage the majority of these patients. Uh, it helps to have a referral network uh, of other physicians, including a neuroradiologist, a neurologist, an internist, a uh, neurosurgeon, and rheumatologist. And these are all that I've been actually working and cultivating since I, I left academia and, and moved to a new location. And it's a, you know, sometimes a challenge to, uh, to meet these people, but we, you need to send letters, you need to pick up the phone, talk to people, and before you know it, you have a nice referral network where they send to you and you can send to them and work and work it out. Now, my philosophy is if you follow a few simple principles and rules, you can manage 90% of the neuroophthalmic disease that comes into a practice. And the reason is neuroophthalmologists are few and far between. You know, they, they do need help and, you know, they do appreciate our help. And there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that we can do uh, in the neuroophthalmic arena. So I really encourage everybody to not fear these patients, but sit down, think through it, and you'll find that it's not as challenging as you, as you may have feared. Now, I, here's a personal case to prove my point. And my point is, 
if you follow rules and principles, you can diagnose 90% 90, 90 of these patients. And the patient was my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law uh, was examined by some other colleagues uh, a time ago, and she had some unexplained visual phenomenon that was actually turned out to be uh, irregular corneum surface disorder, but they ran a visual field on the patient uh, and my mother-in-law and she looked like this. My colleagues try to tell us you know, or, or suggested that there is a bitemporal defect and with a bitemporal defect, we have to think there's a possibility of chiasmal compression either above or below. And these are her visual fields. And you can see there, there's field loss in both, you know, both eyes and they're both temporal. So I can see where this would, would fall in the category possibly uh, being considered to be bitemporal. But the key feature here that we should always think about is when you have chiasmal compression, you're getting chiasmal compression from below pituitary, chiasmal compression from above, craniopharyngeal, raptus pouch. It's going to start at the blind spot and go one direction or the other. It's not going to be kind of hugging uh, the blind spot like we see here. And I look at that and while it, you know this was initially called a bitemporal defect, I call this an enlarged blind spot. Now, looking at this, there are a number of things that can cause enlarged blind spots. Papilledema, disc edema, disc drusen, high myopia, uh, parapapillary atrophy, tilted disc syndrome. So my wife was a little concerned when she heard this and, and, and brought this to me. And she was worried that her mother had a brain tumor. I'm looking at this and I tried to explain, you know, it, does she have anything unusual about her optic nerves? Because to me, this is probably a congenital anomaly. And my wife couldn't, uh, couldn't tell me. So I, uh, I got a chance to examine her and she looked like that. And she has clearly uh, tilted disc syndrome and she has large uh, areas of, uh, of parapapillary atrophy. This is scleral enlage. And there's the expl explanation for our enlarged blind spot. And I explained it to my wife and you know, she was worried. And I said, look, you know, if you want to go to the, the, the peer review literature, right there, here, you know, here's an example, bitemporal visual field defects, mimicking chiasmal compression, isotilted disc syndrome. You know, don't just take my word for it. You know, it's out there in the published literature. So this was a pretty easy and straightforward case uh, with, uh, with a family member that really amounted to nothing. So here's an important rule to remember. Congenital optic nerve anomalies can sometimes have very dramatic uh, visual field loss. And a lot of times we, we get into these where it's a pseudoglaucoma disappearance. And our challenge at that point is trying to figure out, was this a progressive change? Uh, was it always like this? And unless we can somehow you know, retrospectively get some old, old records, one never knows. And it gets really sometimes very challenging. Now, here's a case, the 41-year-old male, this is while I was still at the university supervising one of my residents. So this is a person who complained about a little blur at distance, but was correctable with 2020 each eye with some uh, myopic correction. But she noticed there was constricted visual fields on this patient. Now, there was no afferent defect, the pressure is 15 and 14. There is questionable pallor with small cups. And he had an interesting history. He had a brain MRI years ago, but he could not tell us actually why. He didn't seem to remember. He said maybe it was because he had headaches. So we take a look here and, you know, we have nerves that look a little bit kind of waxy and yellow more than anything. And we see that there's virtually no cup there. As I go around the rim, there's no obscuration of any vessels. There is no, uh, no hemorrhaging. There's no exudation. There's no parapapillary edema. There's no retinal folds. It does look right there like we have some superficial disc drusen. And that's my first, uh, first thought is we have an anomalous nerve here. And it's most likely buried disc drusen. Now we take a look at the patients on the OCT and you know, what do we see here is you know, there's virtually no cup. All right, there's no cup there. There are some abnormalities. We can see there's a relatively 
sparse neural retinal uh, uh, nerve fiber layer. There is an abnormal ganglion cell complex in the right eye. So there is some structural abnormalities here. Now we take a look uh, with some high definition Im images. We can see that internal lumpy, bumpy appearance there. There's no spread of edema uh, anywhere. The Brooks membrane is not being thrust forward anywhere. And we can clearly see a pretty distinct uh, disc drusen that has broken through superficially. Now we take a look at the visual field and you know, the structural abnormalities, we look at the functional abnormalities and there is a very dense uh, field defect. And these are 30-2 fields. And as we take a look, particularly in the, uh, in the left eye, it looks like we have a breakout and it's very quadrantic. There's something over there, even though it does cross. And we wonder, you know, we have a reason for abnormalities or structural abnormalities. It explains the functional abnormalities. Is this the kind of patient that I'm gonna consider getting an image on? Well, the answer is yes because there is a certain quadrantic appearance to it, though I've got a reason for it to be like this. And this is exactly the kind of person I would still recommend an MRI on, even though my anticipation is it's going to be normal. Hey Joe, uh, before, you, before you get too deep, we, yeah. had, uh, we had a question that came in. It says, can you explain again how that visual field, which would be a few visual fields back now, shows an enlarged blind spot and not by temporal loss. Well, there's our blind spot. And as, as we see around it, you know, one can argue that is, that is going to be just an enlargement. Now, good question. As I, as I point out, when we have chiasmal compression, it's from above or below. If we have from above, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have a superior temporal defect. If it's from above, we're gonna have an inferior temporal defect but there's nothing that's gonna compress the chiasm and give this type of defect above and below unless it were complete, a complete temporal hemimapic defect. So that's why I call this a large blind spot. Hey Joe, and another little tidbit that I've learned being kind of a, in a little bit into OCTs is that, and I have to find the, uh, the, the, the there's a couple of reference articles out there that if you have a bitemporal hemianopia on a visual field, you should on a GCC have a binasal. And they're actually, in the article that I was reading and I found the second article says that that can actually show up years before the bitemporal defect. So you, you might know that, Joe, you're pretty well read, but the yeah, neuro, neuro ophthalmology is familiar with the ganglion cell abnormalities and some of these compressive lesions and chiasmal, retrochiasmal lesions. The only problem is they're not absolute, meaning that they don't always happen. You know, there are patients that will have the, the bitemporal defect from a, from a pituitary adenoma, yet they don't have that GCC binasality, I guess you can say. Now at this patient, we didn't do any fundus autofluorescence, uh, B scan, it, you know, really confirmed optic nerve drusen, MRI. You know, what about those fields? You know, there there is a certain quadrantic uh, appearance to it, and people are allowed to have more than uh, one condition. So this is actually a person that I did recommend uh, MRI on, and we ordered it, and it came back normal. So this is all due to disc drusen. Now, question is. I get asked a lot is, do you treat this and can you treat this? And the answer is no. Now, if a patient had disc drusen and had structural and functional abnormalities and an elevated intraocular pressure, I can justify prophylactic pressure reduction in a situation like that. But if this patient has a normal interocular pressure, there's no evidence that lowering pressure is going to help. And no, alpha-GAN is not neuroprotective. We don't need to put the patient on this medicine. Now, yes, as usual, I like to have the audience participate in the program, but it's not very easy to do. So, Greg, I'm going to ask you to uh, help me out here. Is that okay? I'm willing and able. All right. We're gonna do a question. I'm gonna have, you're gonna help me write the question and you're gonna help me figure out the answer. Greg, give me any age you want. 
Uh, 60 years old. All right, male or female? Female. Okay. A 60-year-old female presents with a, pre with a pre patient with a previous history of cancer presents with, give me any neuro op finding you want. Um, diplopia. Diplopia, okay. Also, the patient complains of, give me any symptom you want. Um, headache. All right, very good. Additionally, you know, give me any medical finding you want, any medical condition you want. Uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Okay. So a 60-year-old, you said female? Yep. Presents with, with a patient with a previous history of cancer, presents with diplopia. The patient also complains of headache. Additionally, you know, uncontrolled diabetes. What is the most likely cause that this patient has? Is it cancer? Is it cancer? Is it cancer? Or is it all the above? Greg, what do you think? Well, I think it's going to be cancer. Or all the above, yes. Important to remember, never diagnose idiopathic or ischemic anything in a patient with a history of cancer. Now, there is a difference between a woman who's been with breast cancer treated 25 years ago with mastectomy and remission ever since versus a man treated last year with prostate cancer. But cancer is cancer until proven otherwise. I can, I can say that in my practice here at the uh, at Center for Sight, I've had a number of, of neuro-ophthalmic issues you know, where, where the underlying cause was cancer. But the most important thing is they had a history of cancer. I'll give you an example. 70 something year old man comes in with, with uncomplicated or slightly uncomplicated vertical diplopia. He had a new onset for their palsy. Two prism base down uh, in, front, in front of the palsy eye relieved his diplopia. He also tells me, you know, doc, my, my, my gripper is off. You know, my, 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 my left hand's not really as strong as I think it, it should be, okay? Now you have fourth nerve palsy and you have uh, a hemiparesis. Now, his, his medical history, lung cancer. He was on maintenance chemotherapy for previously diagnosed lung cancer. This is probably the only fourth nerve palsy I think in my entire career I've ever neuroimaged. I saw him on a Thursday. By Monday, he was in hospice because he had metastatic lung cancer to the brain. And that's what I just talked about. You know, this is a person being treated for lung cancer. Uh, he is quote unquote in remission, but he is on maintenance chemotherapeutic uh, regimen. That was it. You know, he had metastatic disease. Greg, that brings me to polling question number one. Are you able to launch that for us? Which of the following is considered a neuroophthalmic emergency? Acute painful double vision, acute painful vision loss, acute painful ptosis, acute painful pupil dilation, or acute painful pupil meiosis. What do you all think? And Greg, have we launched the handout during, during the talk yet? Not yet. I'm going to okay. get it there because it's not in the folder where I thought it was, but I'm re-downloading it. So what's the neuro-op emergency? Acute painful double vision, acute painful vision loss, acute painful dosis, acute painful pupil dilation, acute painful pupil myosis. And not an easy question, very thought provoking. And Joe, I'm downloading the handouts. You just let me know and you want the poll ended. Oh, I, oh, I can do that. Okay. We didn't get a good return. We don't want to go too, too long. We have a lot of material to cover tonight. We got to turn people into neuro-optometrists. Neuro All right, excellent. So I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. And we're pretty well split. The only thing I have here, a little bit different, a little bit of a leader, was acute painful pupil dilation. But uh, otherwise, we're pretty evenly split. And those are really all good answers. Acute painful blank is a neuroophthalmic emergency. The answer is acute painful anything. Put anything you want in the double vision. Okay, that could be a third nerve palsy. Acute painful dilated pupil, third nerve palsy. Acute painful small pupil, 
corner syndrome, carotid dissection, acute painful bitemporal defect, pituitary apoplexy, acute painful anything is a neuroophthalmic emergency. Wow, Greg, that brings me away to polling question number two. Do you show me to launch that one? A 50-year-old man wakes up three months ago with count fingers vision in his right eye and comes in now. How long do you have to evaluate and figure out what is wrong with this person? An hour, a day, two days, or three months? And Joe, I was able to get the handout into the chat box. Tremendous. Thank you, Greg. All right. Looks we're like moving we're... through nicely. So a 50-year-old man wakes up three months ago. He can't see out of his eye, right eye. And now he comes in and figures, I'm going to get this looked at. Comes in after three months. How long do you have to figure out what's wrong? An hour, a day, two days, or three months? And we've ended the poll and we're sharing. The majority say three months. It does seem like a long time, but it isn't. The best one, I think one of the best pearls I can give everybody here is the urgency of evaluation is dictated by the duration of the condition. Now, of course, with any rule, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I usually kind of follow this. If it's been, you know, sudden vision loss of an hour, you get an hour to figure it out. Double vision of two days, you get two days to figure it out. Uh, headache uh, of, of a month, you probably have a month to figure. You know, something's been there for a year, you know, you're, you're normal, go home, you're bothering me. You know, there, there's something wrong with you. So however long it's been there is kind of your guideline of how long you got to figure this out. You don't have to necessarily have all the answers in that 15 or 20 minute time limit that the patient is in your chair. Nice example, 46 year old male wakes up three months ago, not being able to see in his right eye. He has light perception in 2020. He's got profound disc pallor, but no other concurrent findings. He doesn't remember when his last medical examination, so he has no known medical history. He actually saw one of my residents who didn't text me, didn't call me, didn't phone a friend. Interestingly enough, over the weekend, she, you know, she learned and she is in practice now and did phone a friend on a patient. But she got nervous and sent the patient to the emergency room. How long do we have to get this worked up? And we have about three months. It's been like that. It's not going to get much worse. It's not going to get any better. So however long it's there, it's a good idea of how long you can, uh, you can take in order to figure things out. Now, this is a course on rules, and rules really should be obeyed. It's a fit, the patient, a 57-year-old female who has a low-risk ocular hypertensive in HI. Now, her OCT, GDX, optic nerve, these are all perfectly normal. Let's just take a look. We can see, you know, this patient's got some large nerves, some large cups. The, the rim tissue is robust. The rim tissue is pink. There's no focal notches. There's no nerve fiber layer defects. Probably a pressure of around 23 with average uh, pachymetry. So we take a look at the patient. We, uh, we do the complete examination. We check the pachymetry, go on the oscopy, do the photographs. Everything is good. Bring the patient back and we, uh, we run an OCT. OCT comes back pristine. Everything looks fantastic. GCC was also uh, very guys to clip it in here. I was just about done with the patient in terms of evaluation. I thought, well, the patient you know, is ocular hypertensive. Let's bring her back one more time, check the pressure uh, and get a visual field. Now the fields were somewhat surprising. Field looked like this. And one has to ask, where's the lesion? Now, when we look at this, we wonder about the lesion. It's, it is, ver I mean, clear this is vertically oriented. Those are all less than zeros. 
So we automatically, because we have a vertical, we have a vertical cut in the visual field, we have to think this is chiasmal or it's retrochiasmal. So the question is, where is the lesion? Well, to answer that, you really want to look at the fellow eye because that will help localize where things are. When we look at the fellow eye, it looks fantastic. So the question is, where is the lesion? Now, most people start to backtrack and think that this is disease anterior to the chiasm or anterior visual pathway. But that's a really interesting vertical cut. Now, the issue is this patient has normal acuity. They have normal color vision. They don't have a pupil defect. We saw the optic nerve. The optic nerve looked fine. The retina looked fine. The OCT looked fine. Now, there's, there's nothing that actually supports that this is anterior visual pathway disease. Now, before one gets anxious and starts ordering MRIs, and when ordering MRIs or ordering neuroimaging of any kind, Always understand that the best neuroradiologist in the world can't help you if you don't order the scan, order the right scan, and tell them what to look for. And if you don't know what to tell them to look for, it's going to be a very long day with probably un unprodu unproductive imaging. This is something that really should not exist. Ergo, what's the easiest thing to do? Just repeat the field. Repeating the field looks like this. Now, what happened was, I was teaching at the university. The student was a perimetrist. Patient had never done a visual field before. And the student started by telling the patient or instructing the patient, we're going to start off and we're going to test your right side first. She didn't say right eye. She said right side. She probably said it a couple of times. The patient was under the impression she should ignore everything on the left, which is what she did. So this is just a patient exquisitely following the instructions given to her, showing us this visual field deficit. It's pretty impressive, Joe, that the patient was able to do that. That's awesome. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and Greg, imagine if she had done that in both eyes, how much unnecessary testing <laughs> she would have gotten that day. <laughs> That's true. So rule, chiasmal and retrochiasmal lesions will virtually always have bilateral involvement. Now unilateral field loss is anterior visual pathway disease, but it's got to show you something that's identifiable that you can hang your hand on. There's going to be damage to the vision, to the nerve, to the nerve fiber layer, to the color vision, or the pupillary pathway, the afferent pathway. If it isn't there, you're not dealing with anterior visual pathway disease. So here's an important rule. A patient can fake a field, but they can't fake a nerve fiber layer or, or pupil defect. So always remember that. Now here's a patient, 59 year old male who present for a routine examination to our primary care clinic at the university while I was there. Cup to disc ratio was assessed at about a five by five. Pressure is 20 in each eye. Patient was given a prescription for glasses, progressives and sent on his way. Now he comes back for his exam two years later, complaining of a slowly progressive loss of vision in the right eye. He's got a relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye, 2080 acuity in the right eye, 2020 in the left. He's got superior altitudinal defect splitting fixation in the right eye with a mild inferior defect in the left eye. He is noted to have disc pallor. At that point, he was diagnosed with a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, or they told him, you've had a stroke in, their eye, in your eye, there's nothing that can be done, there's no treatment for it, and that was it. Now, I had not seen the patient uh, at that point, but that was what he, he was told. Now, one has to ask, what is wrong with this picture? There's about four things wrong here with the diagnosis of non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. And here they are, and we'll start, we'll start working our way backwards. Patient has a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy, quote unquote, in the right eye, yet the patient has inferior defects in the left eye. And that's a little bit unusual. You have to have an explanation for that. Also, the patient has a superior defect splitting fixation in the right eye, 
in ischemic neuropathies, it's six to one, an inferior defect. He complains of a slowly progressive loss of vision in the right eye. Ischemic neuropathies are relatively abrupt and apoplectic. This, is not, this was slowly progressive. And probably the thing that should caution you the most is the cup to disc ratio. Non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is a disease of non-cupping. 97% of patients with non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy have this small, crowded, disc at risk, no visible cup or a very, very small cup. And the rest of them were just misdiagnosed. A CD ratio of five by five just doesn't fit in there. So there are too many things wrong with this diagnosis of convenience. I got a chance to see the patient after that and follow up pressure is 23 and is actually 95% cupped uh, in glaucoma. Now, this is not the patient, but this is a representative example where this white glial tissue is not the cup at all. The cup is all the way, the rim tissue is all the way out here. This is a person who had an undiagnosed case of primary open angle glaucoma. It was not treated and he ultimately progressed to lose fixation. Don't make diagnosis of non-arteritic anterior skin optic neuropathy in glaucoma patients. I've actually seen this happen far too many times. Both are optometric and ophthalmologic colleagues with a glaucoma patient, they look and there's power of the neuroretinal rim in excessive cupping. It's easy to say, well, you probably had a stroke in the eye. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is a great diagnosis of convenience. There's no test that will conclusively prove it. And if there was, you know, there was, there is no treatment for it. There's nothing that really needs to be done. Remember the rule, a diagnosis of exclusion should be your last diagnosis, not your first. And there are a number of diagnoses that we use that are not really appropriate. Ades tonic pupil, for example. Ades tonic pupil is a light near dissociated pupil in a young, healthy female with loss of deep tendon reflexes. There are other things that can cause a tonic pupil. Diabetes can do it, zoster can do it, giant cell arteritis can do it. There are a number of things that can cause that. Pseudotumor, all right, there, you know, that is that is simply increased intracranial pressure in the, in the absence uh, of a mass lesion. But there are other things that can cause that, being a sinus thrombosis, medication use, and yes, even brain, you know, even uh, even tumors can be there. Pseudotumor is actually a diagnosis of exclusion. Bell's palsy, well, there are certain irritative lesions that can actually cause a facial paralysis. Uh, I just talked about non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Telosa Hunt syndrome, about 100 years ago, a guy named Telosa and a guy named Hunt saw several patients with painful ophthalmoplegia with normal skull x-rays, and now you have Telosa Hunt syndrome. There are a number of other inflammatory diseases, including neurosarcoid, that can cause that same picture. So these are all diagnoses of exclusion. They should be your last diagnosis instead of your first diagnosis. Nice example, 48-year-old male, painless loss of visual field in left eye, 2020 in each eye. He noticed that when he woke up one morning, he just knew something wasn't right. We can see that there is an inferior arc rate defect uh, newly formed in his left eye. Right eye looks fine. And we take a look and there is a hyperemic swollen optic nerve, uh, teal injectatic disc capillaries, uh, juxtapapillary hemorrhages uh, in the left eye. His right eye is a very small crowded disc at risk and there's just glial tissue there. And this is a clear clinical diagnosis of non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Here's a rule. Non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative. It isn't about what it is. It's about what it isn't. And how can you really diagnose non-arteritic until you prove that it is not arteritic? Now, there are certain patient profiles where arteritic ischemic neuropathies really just aren't possible. 
But if you're in those, those gray zones and you're not quite sure, yeah, get the test. Get the sed rate, get the C-reactive protein, get the hemoglobin, get the platelet count. You need to diagnose in the negative. How do you, how do you diagnose non-arteric? By proving it's not arteritic. Very, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a, is a hypoperfusion to the anterior optic nerve, which can be non-arteritic or, or arteritic. In the non-arteritic version, you, know, you have arterial sclerotic disease, uh, cataract surgery, smoking, uh, hyperlipidemia, these all contribute. In the arteritic form, it's, it, you know, it is an autoimmune uh, vasculitis, which has a high risk of contralateral involvement, uh, if not caught. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy usually presents with a very pale swollen optic nerve and pain of some sort. Head pain, jaw pain, eye pain, facial pain, ear pain, girdle pain. Uh, there's usually a very severe optic nerve dysfunction. Visual field defects are very similar between both optic neuropathies. And in arteritic, giant cell arteritis or polymyalgia rheumatica are, are strong risk factors. Typically average age in the 70s, it's not that common under the age of 60, but any patient over 50 is at risk. So once a patient's over 50, this is actually always on the menu. And there's a very high risk of bilateral involvement uh, if we don't uh, catch this. Very treatable disease, but it's going to progress on in 65% of patients to involve the fellow eye on an average of about uh, 10 days. So I really have to ask about the non-visual symptoms. Headache is very common, uh, scalp tenderness, uh, ear pain, jaw claudication, malaise, intermittent fevers. Uh, serology, sed rate is very good, but it can be lowered by statins and NSAID. C-reactive protein, is not gonna be affected by those medicines. And of course, an elevated platelet count uh, can help with the diagnosis. Now, initial symptoms, uh, headache, very, very common. Polymyalgia rheumatica, think chair and stare. You know, if you ask an 80 year old person, you know, do, you know, does your body ache? They're gonna say yes. But in this disease, they have difficulty getting out of chairs. They have difficulty walking upstairs. Also, hair, it hurts when they comb their hair. You can have fever of unknown origin. Visual symptoms without vision loss, transit ischemic attacks. They have a brief blackout, but they're normal in your exam room. Or they intermittently complain of double vision, but there's no ophthalmoparesis in your exam room. Weakness, malaise, fatigue, these are all common things. And what do they all have in common? they can all have a normal exam. That your, actually your examination can show everything being normal, but they have these gangbuster symptoms. Here's a nice example. I saw this uh, late afternoon on a Friday. 66 year old female, new onset sudden hey, hey Joe, yeah. hey Joe, before yeah. you jump into the case, we sure. had a question roll in. It's not, a, it came to as a direct message to me. Um, it says, was there ever any definitive thoughts on a guy like this being counseled against Viagra type medications? That's a really good question. And the answer is, I think it's overblown. I think that is uh, a, a relatively unfounded fear. There's about 53 cases pre uh, presented in the literature, maybe a few more in the last several years, where patients using the erectile dysfunction medicines developed a, a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Yes, you have to, con you have to consider that they've had a, an ischemic neuropathy, they are at risk. You can discuss it with the patient so they can, they can make an informed uh, decision. But if you consider the number of reported cases versus the millions and millions of doses, probably on a daily basis, I think that the fear is somewhat unfounded. That's a really good question. You can educate them and let a patient make an informed decision. 
Yeah, at our last meeting where we had Dr. Andy Lee, he had his hate medications, which was hydroxychloroquine, uh, amiodarone, tetracycline, and ethambutol. Those were kind of his hate medications in a sense of uh, optic neuropathy within uh, neuroophthalmic disease. But he also did kind of have this kind of, just like Joe mentioned, this kind of this kind of hate, but not hate for the for the Viagra medication. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say Andy Andy Lee, neuroophthalmology extraordinaire. I think he's going to change his opinion. He gets a little bit older. If you know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> 66-year-old female came to our practices a Friday afternoon with a new onset sudden vision loss. She's at 2,400, but she had a long-standing matching of scars. So that the acuity didn't really change, but she knew her visual field change, and she had a really distinct new inferior arcuate defect. Now, I took a look at her. She had disc edema, a little pallor, no hemorrhages, no tail injectation of the disc. Left the disc with small crowded disc at risk, that classic non arteritic type of appearance with a CD less than uh, two. Now, when I, when I questioned her, she had a mild headache, you know, come, you know just uh, comes and goes, relieved by over the counter analgesics. She did mention a little malaise and last of, loss of appetite. She lost about seven pounds over four weeks. No jaw claudication, no temporal head pain. And she was your typical, I would say, Sarasota suburbanite. She, you know, she, this was a, a, a normal appearing fit woman sitting there in my chair in her tennis outfit, I think. I think she had, she had been playing tennis. You know, she was, she was not old and creaky at all. She had a disc at risk. And the question is, what, you know, what do you do in a situation like this? Do you, uh, do you, pull, the, do you pull the fire alarm or... Or do you just ascribe this to, uh, to non-arteritic because the symptoms are very weak. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're all very mild. And the answer I go back is non-arteritic is diagnosed in the negative. And how do you diagnose it? By proving what it isn't. And this is exactly the kind of patient we handled. And I can tell you right now, her SED rate is 96. And how was this handled? Okay, this was handled by explaining it to her. I sent her to the emergency room. I told her exactly what to do and what was going on. I also gave her my cell phone number. Several hours later, I got a call from the ER physician and I see about one of these patients a month and the same thing happens virtually every time. I always give them my cell phone number. Within a few hours, I'm gonna get a call. It's the ER physician who's informing of what the, the serology is. And CRP is, you know, sometimes a little slow to come back, but ESR is pretty quick. And they ask, okay, what do I do next? These are people who are ER physician and hospitalists. They are, they are knowledgeable, but they're not experienced and not competent in this. What do I do next? Do I get a biopsy? How do I get a biopsy? Who can I get a biopsy from? What dose this? And they ask, they ask, what dose the steroid? And I tell them it's two, it, it, it's 250 milligrams solumedrol four times every six hours. Okay, every six hours, and you need 12 doses, and that usually means hospital admission. And a couple hours after, I'm going to get another phone call from the hospitalist who's admitting the patient who wants to go over the case with me and ask the same thing: What's the dosing? How do I administer it? When do I release them? And how much steroid do I release them on? And the answer is they should leave the 80 milligrams uh, of prednisone by mouth after three days into the heart, waiting arms of rheumatology. Now these are, you know, these are good physicians, but they don't have experience and they don't have confidence and they will always call and ask, what do I do next? Greg, it brings me to polling question number three. What feature indi indicates something other than glaucoma? Is it disc hemorrhage? Is it disc pallor? Is it notching of the rim tissue or is it parapapillary atrophy? And Greg, is there any, uh, any questions I should be answering? Yep, uh, one came in and it says, um, how do you ask about joint pain when ruling out GCA? Well, I, I, the, the, the important one, the important, most important thing is 
do you have trouble getting out of out of out of this chair? Like if you're sitting in a recliner, do you have trouble getting up? And that is usually a yes. Do you have trouble walking upstairs? Now it's not just joint pain as an arthritis. You're, you're talking about polymyalgia, muscle. And these are the muscles that are being affected by the disease, the ones that help them get out of the chair and walking upstairs. So hair, hair, stair, chair are all things you should always remember. Does it hurt when you comb your hair? Great, I'll tell you, the last GCA patient that I had with ischemic neuropathy was 88 years old who had no symptoms. All right. And we, we got them admitted for three days of steroids and biopsy. Uh, another thing to kind of remember out there is, you know, when you look at the blood work, you know, the C-reactive protein goes up, sed rate goes up, platelets go up if you do a complete blood count. And I'm really not sure why I've tried trying to figure that out. I like to know the pathophysiology behind it, but hemoglobin goes down. And if hemoglobin is down, then think about it. They're, they're just, you know, for lack of a better term, hypoxic, right? They're inflamed. And that's why there's all this pain and fatigue. So the hemoglobin is kind of the key. What I always remember goes down and that's why the muscles and they fatigue and they can't chew steak and all that fun stuff um, about there. And I agree, you gotta be careful uh, with, um, you know, with trying to ask about joint pain if someone's 83 years old, right? So um, another one rolled in, Joe, just now. Could you mm -hmm. please repeat your recommendations for IV dose of steroid? Yes. To, uh, they're going to be admitted. And that's the best thing because you know that they're, that they're getting the medicine. 250 milligram, uh, milligram solumedrol every six hours for 12 dosage. So they're, they're going to they're gonna be admitted for, for three days. They're going to they're going to be getting a gram a day for three days. They're going to be they need to be released on at least 80 milligrams of oral prednisone. And they have to be on that until they get into the hands of a rheumatologist. Now, also, you can recommend to the hospitalists uh, who's admitting them, you know, give them some antacids for their stomach, uh, watch their diabetes and give them something to help them sleep because they, they will become insomnic uh, on that type of, that type of uh, dose. There are Joe, why medicines. don't you go, why don't you go over, um, I know you got some slides to do, but uh, you know, you're still going to see this patient back. They're still going to want you to follow the patient. Uh, mm -hmm. You're just not going to want, you know, once they're out of the hospital and they got their IV steroids, you still need to follow this patient. Yeah, you, you, you need to follow the patient, but they also need to be like in the, in the hands of, of rheumatology. And you have, you're probably going to have to help them definitively make the diagnosis. Now, I will tell you, more and more, we're getting away from temporal artery biopsy in favor of tem temporal artery ultrasound. In fact, in, in Europe, they're not doing biopsies anymore at all. They're actually just doing ultrasounds. And it's actually in the right hands is pretty effective. But yeah, you're, you're going to see the patient back. You're going to see, is there any visual recovery? Some of these patients can have some visual recovery with treatment. Uh, but our goal really is to prevent them from getting worse. All right. So what other, is something other than glaucoma indicates something else? Uh, number one comes up as optic disc pallor. And I think that is, uh, that is actually the winner there. Power and excessive cupping indicate something other than or in addition to glaucoma. And I'm not talking about 95% where, where you're looking at just scleral tissue and laminar tissue. I'm talking the 60 or 70% cupped nerve where you can actually see pale, you know, pale tissue. That is something other than or in addition to glaucoma. But here's another rule that goes hand in hand. Nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. Tumors don't notch nerves, trauma, infection, inflammation, uh, infiltrations. None of these things will notch a, a, a nerve like glaucoma. Focal defects to the neuroretinal rim, which remains pink, is glaucoma. Now, I also get asked the question, you know, we got imaging now. Do we really need to do fields? We have OCT. We got ganglion cell complex. We've got OCTA. Do we really need to do fields? The answer is yes. 
He's a 54 year old man from Africa who's referred me for glaucoma management. He was told he had glaucoma six years earlier in Africa, but he underwent no treatment. I don't know why. He has 2030 right eye, hand motion left eye, and he complained of a slowly progressive loss of vision in his left eye. Now he was initially seen in a primary care clinic where they said, you've got vision loss from glaucoma. It's not coming back. We have to preserve the, the vision in your good eye. His initial intraocular pressure was 30 in the right eye, 23 in the left. He was put onto a prostaglandin and referred to me and at that point. His pressure was uh, 17 and 15, the prostaglandin was working. And what we can see here is a relatively large nerve in each eye with a large cup to this ratio, about a 0.7 to 0.75 maybe. And what I like about photographs is you can actually put them side by side and make a good comparison. And in the right eye, we've got a very pink rim tissue. Everything it seems well perfused, but in contrast, right to left eye, the optic nerve is pale. And I think probably one of the easiest ways to see power is not just clinically, but photographically. You know, I work with my wife and uh, we're in the office uh, about a week or so ago and she pulled up a, a photograph to show me, said, and, and she said, take a look at this. And my response is, it's pale. I mean, it's just very clear. I mean, on a picture, it's pale. So a photograph's very helpful. His neurofiber analysis was relatively normal in the right eye. And it was somewhat abnormal in the left eye. One may wonder, do we really need to do fields? The answer is yes. Uh, here's a patient who's got a significant bitemporal defect. He had a large pituitary macroadenoma that was actually compressing the posterior aspect of the left optic nerve. And there is his vision loss. And this is a person whose OCT nerve fiber layer really wasn't that disturbed and was certainly not diagnostic of this. So we still need to do fields in the age of imaging because sometimes it's not glaucoma. Now, sometimes glaucoma can get complicated. He's a 70 year old male. I've been seeing him for a number of years for primary open angle glaucoma. Then one day he gets into an auto accident with, uh, with, uh, concussion and loss of consciousness. Afterwards, he developed this gaze-induced amaurosis, meaning that when he looked in a certain direction, his vision would black out. He mentioned this to his primary care physician who immediately referred to him to a neuro-ophthalmologist. Now, rightfully so, the neuro-ophthalmologist was thinking there's a retro, there, there's a retro bulbar mass because when a person looks in a certain direction, there is an excursion of the optic nerve. There's only so much room in the posterior orbit. And if there's something growing there, it will, it will get compressed. There's a transient cessation of axoplasmic flow and blood flow, the vision blacks out. When the patient looks in another direction, the optic nerve moves away, vision comes back. So when they start losing, they lose vision and looking in a certain direction of the gaze, one has to consider there's a probably a retro bulbar mass in the posterior orbit. That's what the neuro-ophthalmologist thinks, orders an MRI, MRI is negative, there's no mass. So he attributed it to psychological vision loss, which is a dangerous, very dangerous diagnosis. There are terms that we shouldn't use. We shouldn't use psychological vision loss because we're not psychologists, we're not psychiatrists. We shouldn't use the term malingering. We're not qualified, and neuro-ophthalmologists are not qualified to assess malingering, because malingering usually means they're seeking some sort of gain. All we can say is non-organic vision loss. If we can't find a cause, we call it non-organic vision loss. Well, the patient was not happy with being called crazy. So he comes back to me and explains everything. And we take a look, I'm gonna show you this. And here are his optic nerves. And there are two things I wanna point out. Fact number one is these nerves are not pale in any way. There's no pallor of the neuroretinal rim. So he does not violate rule number one. If we take a look at the, at the rim tissue, 
He is notched superiorly. He is notched inferiorly. There's quite a bit of parapapillary atrophy. There's almost no rim tissue down here, and there's very little rim tissue up north. So he is notched. Non pale notched equals glaucoma. But he still has this funny looking, uh, this, this funny sounding complaint when he, when he looks in a certain direction, he loses his vision. So I asked him, you know, what precipitate? He said, shaving. Whenever he would shave, he would lose his vision. So I asked him to just go ahead and demonstrate it for me. So he walked to the mirror and he started doing this. And I could see he was moving his hand and head. And he said, I just lost my vision. Now, if you're out there thinking he's compressing the carotid artery, cutting off blood flow, it's even simpler than that. There's his visual field. When he turned his head, his nose would block part of the visual field that compensated. He looks into his paretic field of gaze, and then he's aware of his glaucoma is lost. So sometimes it is glaucoma. And what told me that is the nerves weren't pale, they were notched. That's a lot of stuff to remember. So if you can't remember all that, I want you to remember my O2 cup disc. O to have cup disc pink, that my friend hath a glaucoma to stink. But to have a cup disc pale causes glaucoma, she'll fail. Disc and field damage is one side that simply cannot be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. And if you can remember that, that's all that you need. Greg, are there any questions that come in that, that, that merit our attention? Nope, everything's good. Hmm. Excellent. All right, Case, he's a 46-year-old male. I see a number of patients like this, and it can be somewhat challenging. Complains of a droopy left eye, which began about six weeks earlier. He's got headache and numbness on the same side, and he had hives about the same time. Not really sure what he meant by hives. Uh, he went to an ER where they diagnosed him with a sty and prescribed an ineffective antibiotic. And he is referred to me by a local optometrist. Now, Ocular history is unremarkable. Medical history, mitral valve prolapse and reflux disease. Uh, he is using Prilosec, uh, Metoprolol, uh, antiarrhythmic, Xanax, prednisone for his quote unquote hives. So I saw no skin lesions on him. Uh, Lipitor and Claritin because, oh, sorry, I should also put in there. He had a little cholesterol issue. Now I'm not gonna go through all this. Uh, suffice it to say he had a left upper lid ptosis and a left meiosis. And that leads us to a relatively straightforward diagnosis. Let me take a look at that. And this is what our man looks like. He's got a drooping left eyelid. He's clearly got ptosis. He has meiosis and we have to consider that likely he has got a Horner syndrome. Now, when I'm dealing with Horner syndrome, I like confirmatory testing. We used to use cocaine, where we put cocaine in, a liquid cocaine in an eye, and if it did not dilate, it was relatively indicative of a Horner syndrome. Then about three days later, we used this, this medication called hydroxyamphetamine. And if the pupil, if the pupil dilate, if the pupil didn't dilate, it would tell you that it was further, you know, further downstream. The people, if the pupil did dilate, it was probably something a little bit more sinister. Well, I can tell you, hydroxyamphetamine is not available. Cocaine, while always being available, is not practical to use. But we got something, you know, even better in our armamentarium, and that's simply iapidine you know, 1% or a half percent apoclonidine. You put it in the eye and because of denervation, hypersensitivity, bing, it will cause a reversal. The pupil dilates, the lid comes up and it's pretty impressive and it happens pretty quickly. And when I say that, uh, I actually had a patient uh, or I was talking, it was the end of the day, I was talking to her during the, you know, during the test, you know, she was, uh, she was a physician as well. 
and I put the hydroxyamphetamine in, I would say her lid came up in about four or five minutes. So within about 10, 15 minutes, there is a distinct dramatic change. And this is what he looked like pre-iapidine, post-iapidine. In fact, now it looks like he's got a right Horner syndrome in comparison, causing hey, reversal. Hey, Joe. Yeah. So I understand, you know, post-iapidine, but um, I also in my office, because I have reps that come in, uh, and I have alpha GAN P in my office. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that's the greatest substitution you might want to maybe explain because you know they're kind of in the same category. They're both alpha agonists. Yeah, and and alpha GAN P is a better medication overall. It is much more sensitive for the alpha two receptors. But the thing about iapidine, the original apiclonine, one percent and a half percent is the fact that it's got weak alpha-1 properties. And that's what is being eaten up because in Horner's syndrome, there's a cessation of neurotransmitter being released because the sympathetic plexus is damaged somewhere. And the receptors get so starved for that, that, that neurotransmitter that even something weak, weak alpha-1 properties are gonna give you a dramatic effect. But you know, phenylephrine doesn't have those alpha-1 properties. Uh, bromonidine, uh, alpha-gain doesn't have those, those alpha-1 properties. It's really only apiclonidine. And it's always nice to have an, you know, a bottle in your, I've always got a bottle in my office. I can't, I can't definitively say it's not expired, but I always have a bottle and it only costs about $9 to buy. Another question yeah. came in, yeah. appropriate? at this time, are you putting it in both eyes or just the Horner's eye? You can put it in both eyes to prove that you are, you know, you, you don't have an effect in the other eye, or if you just put it in one eye, it's fine. You can do, you can do either. I think I mostly, I think personally, I, I mostly do the suspect eye. I don't put it in the other eye. Any other questions? I, That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think one of the best things that's, that you can, uh, can help your guys out with would be one of these things here. You saw Joe take a picture there. He has his before and after. I'm constantly using my cell phone, my iPhone, in the, in the, uh, and I said iPhone, so I have no financial interest in Apple. But, uh, um, but uh, I use my iPhone in the, in the office all the time. Take a before, take an after. Um, some of those can be dramatic, but the picture can really make it show up. So take mm -hmm. pictures. Now, I knew the patient had Horner's, but I don't know why. You know, we, we, we still have to figure out why. Headache, neuralgia, and hives. Headache, you know, cluster migraine can cause a Horner's syndrome, yeah, but it really wasn't a, a, a cluster migraine. Zostra can do it, but the hives really didn't sound like zostra to me. So yeah, what I wanted was a medical evaluation by his PCP and, and decide I'm going to get the uh, re, get those results and, and see if there's anything else that could be wrong with this fellow. Now remember, it's been like this for six weeks. So I've got six weeks to figure things out. And Horner's is, is a disruption of sympathetic innervation to the eye and face and lid cause of uh, meiosis tosis uh, and anhydrosis. And I can tell you, I don't get into putting cornstarch on a patient. If a patient shares with me, I don't sweat on the side of my face. I'm fine with that. That's good. That's good for me. And this is a very long three neuron pathway that begins in the dorsal lateral hypothalamus. It goes down the uh, spinal column to, the, to about the T1 level where it synapses. That's number one. It goes over the apex of the lung to the superior cervical ganglion. That's synapse number two. Then it goes from the superior cervical ganglion to the pupil, to the Mueller's muscle, and to the sweat glands of the face. So one, two, three. There's a lot of area here where things can go wrong. That's why Horner's syndrome is relatively common, common uh, condition to see. We talked about this. So I do want to say that this denervation supersensitivity takes a little while to develop, usually about 36 to 72 hours. And if you get somebody who's really, really fresh, it may not work. Now, we all were taught that 
things that were post-ganglionic were relatively benign and things that were pre, you know, pre-ganglionic, the first or second, were the really bad ones. And there are a number of things, stroke, vertebral bowel sort of insufficiency, demyelinating disease, severe osteoarthritis, tumor, panko syndrome. People with pain in the arm and the scapular region should can be considered having a pancos tumor. Now, third order neurons, headache syndromes, uh, paratroid geminal syndrome, carotid dissection, zoster. There's a number of things. I'll be honest with you. Bad things happen everywhere. We can't, we don't have hydroxyamphetamine to localize where it's occurring. We don't need it. Bad things happen everywhere. We really need to consider that there might be something bad going on in these patients. So it's best to do a targeted workup based upon the patient's profile and symptoms. Neck and facial pain, we gotta consider carotid dissection. Facial paresthesias, middle cranial fossil disease. If you don't know where to look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of area here. These patients need about three scans. You have to scan from the head to the chest. They're gonna need an MRI of the brain orbit and chiasm with and without contrast with attention to the middle cranial fossa. They need a CT angiogram of the head and neck to rule out carotid dissection. And they need an MRI of the neck and C-spine which includes lung apex and brachial plexus. These are three scans that they need. Now, if you can't remember that, the imaging center should have what they call a Horner's protocol or you can simply tell them image the sympathetic pathway, the ocular sympathetic pathway. Now this is a patient, uh, he actually did not go to his physician. He did come back to me for a follow-up. At that point, I ordered all of the scans and they all came back negative. He's still alive, it's all good fun. But what I wanna point out is the one thing that we really need to look for is carotid dissection. This is a very common cause of Horner's syndrome. This is a linear tear in the carotid artery within the neck. The oculosympathetic plexus in the neck travels with the carotid artery. So things that happen to the carotid happen to the oculosympathetic plexus. And this linear tear leads to a thrombus formation. That thrombus formation can lead to emboli. Emboli can lead to catastrophic stroke. These are people who are at high risk of catastrophic stroke. This is one of the true neuro-ophthalmic emergencies that we're going to see, a painful Horner syndrome. Eye pain, face pain, neck pain, head pain, surgical trauma, uh, whiplash trauma, uh, chiropractic trauma, or sometimes it's just spontaneous. But if they have this linear tear, they're clotting and they can embolize and they are at severe risk. These are people that need to go to the emergency room and you need to tell them what to look for. Now, if you send a patient to the ER, I can guarantee you what's going to happen is they're going to do a CT of the head because they're only looking for a hemorrhage, looking for stroke. You need to tell them what you're looking for how to look for it and where to look for it. And the best thing to do is a CT angiogram or an MR angiogram. You need one of those two tests. 52% of these patients will have a hemispheric stroke within about six days. Two thirds are gonna have it within the first week, 90% within two weeks. After 31 days, they're out of the woods. The vessel wall will repair itself. They need stroke prophylaxis. They need to be heparized or, or, or antiplateleted. It's not wrong to recommend an aspirin for these patients while they're waiting. You know, patients with suspected carotid dissection should go right to the ER. So confirm it's Horner syndrome. Determine if it's accidental or surgical and get the urgent imaging if it's been there for less than two weeks. And really the best thing to do is, you know, look for that carotid dissection. And of course, we want to image the lung apex, the possibility of the patient having cancer. Hey, Joe, Here's, before yeah. before you go on, um, did this guy have recent trauma 
in the area or high force chiropractic manipulation? That's an excellent question. He had none of this. The, there, these are direct messages, so you won't mm -hmm. see these. This one says, could you hear any abnormality with a stethoscope? I would not, I would not recognize a brewery if it came up and bit me in the rear end. I'm going to be very honest. I don't listen to that. Uh, I don't even, I don't even try to do that. So let me just kind of throw a little pearl out that, that I had from a, from a, uh, a primary care doc that it's, if it's flowing well, you won't hear a brewery. It's a very specific amount of blockage to kind of get that whooshing sound because then it could be blocked a lot and then you don't get the whooshing sound. So not hearing it doesn't help you because it could be totally blocked that's out there. So I know we were all taught all that to listen with stethoscopes, but it could be open, it could be blocked. You only get the certain percentage where you kind of get that whooshing sound. So I'm like you, Joe, I wouldn't know if it bit me. Yep. Here's a patient, 73 year old female complains of a swollen left eyelid for about three months. And she's not happy with the previous ophthalmologist. And this is one of the first patients I saw when I moved into this new practice. And I happened to be uh, out, of, out of view behind uh, our front desk. And I could hear her saying they are, I mean, she was very, almost petulant. I thought she was gonna be very, a very challenging patient. They aren't listening to me. She kept saying, they don't listen to me. She says she's a highly allergic patient, had pain and you know, ear blockage on the right side of her face. While she was guarding, thinks maybe something got into her eye. She's been prescribed xylet, azocyte, antihistamines, hot and cold compresses, no improvement. Now her PCP, before she referred her over, did test her for giant, so I give her kudos for that, which was negative. And there's a presumptive allergic reaction. She said she's a very allergic person, but here my problem is, it's, there's no itching, it's persistent, and it's one-sided. Now, she is hypothyroid and a smoker, and she looks like this. You, you really can't tell, but she's frowning under the mask. And when, she, and when I kept hearing her saying to my friend, Des, nobody listens to me, my approach was, I'm going to sit there, I'm just going to listen to her, let her talk. And I sat down, I listened to her, I let her talk. And as I'm sitting there, I said, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've seen this before. Interesting. And what do we see? She's got a ptosis. It's not swollen. It's totic. And her pupil was smaller. And when she was done telling this story and how unhappy she was with everybody else, I said, you don't have an allergy. I think you got Horner syndrome. What do we do? Break out the apiclonidine. This is what she looks like 10 minutes later. You can't tell, there's a smile under that mask now. Her pupils dilated, her lid has come up. I can tell you, 10 minutes after I put the drop in, she was looking for a mirror in my waiting room. Like, my swelling is gone. I said, you're not swollen, you've got Horner syndrome. Before Iapidine, after Iapidine, frowny face, smiley face. She is happy as can be. So we have to try to find out cause. We never assume that it's benign. Of course, I went through the entire evaluation with her in conjunction with her internist and we worked together. We get all the imaging done and nothing came back. And the only thing that I've ascribed it to, of course, at three months, we were outside of the carotid dissection. She either had a heel dissection or she had otitis media. 59-year-old female, long-standing glaucoma patient with a drooping right eye and smaller pupil for about a month, noticed that about the time she had surgery for a newly diagnosed lung cancer. She also reports scapular pain and weakness in her right hand. She's got lung cancer, pancreatitis, hypertension, uh, hypertension acid reflux, and not the healthiest lifestyle. She smokes a pack a day for 45 years and drinks a six pack of beer daily. And the six pack of beer was actually the, the conservative estimate. She, she admits, sometimes I drink a case of beer and she looks like this. And she's got ptosis, she's got meiosis and she already has a diagnosis and she has lung cancer. And so I didn't do any pharmacologic testing in this one. I've seen her many times, this is all new. She didn't have a bit of a dilation lag and I didn't have an apiclonidine in the office at that time. 
newly diagnosed lung cancer, newly diagnosed, uh, newly performed lobectomy, she had pancoast. And this is a tumor, a, a, lung, a lung cancer at the apex of the, of the lung that involves the, uh, the apical chest wall. And we can see kind of where, where it all is, and that's by the oculosympathetic plexus. Treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. I think we all learned, and Greg, I know we've talked about this, like we, we, when we were in second grade optometry school, we thought we'd be seeing lung cancers on a daily basis and, and Marfan syndromes on, on a weekly basis, right? And that just doesn't happen, right? That's exactly it, yeah. Mm -hmm. The prognosis here is not great. You know, five-year survival is, is around 30%. So while this is a potential killer, the prognosis is relatively poor and it's not an emergency. Of course, we want it diagnosed. We want them into the healthcare system, but it's often not gonna be a very good outcome. And, and with, you know, with uh, my patient's uh, lifestyle, it was not conducive to a, to a long life. Trust your inner voice. That's a rule. 78 year old female, and this was, relatively new in my practice as well. She had a sudden onset of ptosis in her left eye, immediately following parathyroid surgery to have three uh, parathyroid adenomas removed. And uh, let me explain to how, how this all came about. It was on a Thursday where she had parathyroid surgery. You can see, you know, there's a surgical incision. And her son noticed her eyelid was very droopy when he drove her home that day from surgery, but ascribed everything to likely anesthesia. She woke up the next morning, her eyelid was drooping. So she called her surgeon who I think uh, got very nervous and sent her to the emergency room that she might have been having a stroke. And at the emergency room, what do they do? A non-contrast enhanced CT of the head because they're looking for hemorrhage. That was normal, she was released. So about four o'clock on Friday afternoon, she comes in to see me as an emergency. And she's explaining this and clearly she has a uh, Horner syndrome. And I, and I actually did a, a iapidine test and she did, uh, she did respond to it even though it was relatively recent. Her eyelid uh, dilated, her pupil dilated and this was clearly a Horner syndrome. She had a reason for a horn syndrome. She had neck trauma. She had neck surgery. This made all the sense in the world. However, she also had eye pain and headache, which she ascribed to recovering from surgery the day before and the anesthesia. Now, I can, I can understand, but I just didn't like the headache and the eye pain in the, in the, in the face of a new diagnosed Horner syndrome. So I recommended and explained to her the possibility of carotid dissection. So we, uh, I told her I wanted to get her image to mute. She absolutely refused. I was just in the ER this morning. I, my scan is normal. I said, they scanned the wrong place. She absolutely refused. She got very emotional over it. She was just not recovered. She's not herself. She feels terrible. Refused to, uh, to get imaged refused to go back to ER. Would you at least use aspirin for me? She said, yes. So I put her on low dose aspirin, called her the next day. She felt better, but still had headache. Called her the next day on Sunday. She feels much better. Her eye hurts a little bit. Her head hurts a little bit. It's just not that bad. Tried to get her image. She refuses. She call, she's a snowbird. She calls her ophthalmologist uh, up in Buffalo explains everything. Her ophthalmologist says, either listen to him or leave him alone. Don't waste his time. Either get the scan or don't go back. So early the following week, I, I get her back in and indeed she had a carotid dissection. Increased her aspirin to three, uh, 350 milligrams, full dose, got her to stroke neurology the next day and she is doing well. So even though she had a reason for, for having a Horner syndrome. Maybe they nicked the oculosympathetic plexus. The eye pain and head pain just didn't match.
To me, that's carotid dissection, and we were right. Greg, why don't we launch polling question number four? And while that's rolling in, Joe, we had a question. Um, okay. How long will the iopidine keep the lid elevated? That's a darn good question. And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the patient. Now, on all these patients, I end up prescribing iopidine. They use it cosmetically. They do sometimes develop a certain tolerance to it. Generally speaking, one drop a day is enough. If they put it in in the morning, it's going to wear off by the early evening. So they use it, they, they use it kind of uh, socially. They, they're going to go out. They're going to get pictures taken. Something, they'll put it in in advance. It's a $9 drug that lasts forever. And my experience is up neat doesn't work or works not nearly as well as uh, iopidine. So I prescribe it for them. They use it PRN. Uh, I've had some patients have to start using like two, three times a day. And th that's because there's developed a tolerance to it. But for the most part, one drop gets them through most of the day if they're inclined to use it. And Joe, to kind of feed off of your previous comment, uh, Upneak has five times higher affinity for the alpha-2 receptor. And that's why it raises the eyelid that way in a non Horner syndrome. So that's probably why you don't get the effect since it's that upregulation of the alpha one. I, uh, I tried it and the, the, the results were relatively unimpressive for that disease. Yes, yeah, it's the alpha two, that's why. Yep. So which uh, Horner syndrome should be sent immediately to ER? An asymptomatic 15 year old with heterochromia, a 65, a 69 year old smoker with cough and a hoarse voice, or a 35 year old with neck pain and headache after receiving a, a, a neck trauma? And the answer is, yeah, the, whenever you suspect that there is Horner syndrome that is caused by carotid dissection, they go right to the ER. Now that's a lot of stuff to remember. So I'm gonna leave in my O to Horner syndrome. When the lid is low and the pupil small, check to see the sweat don't fall. Cocaine is no longer universal. Iopne will cause reversal. You have to scan head to chest. And remember, CTA is best. Pain and association will surely cause commotion. Sent to the ER without correction. Remember, it might be carotid dissection. And if you remember that, that's all you need to know. Anything else coming, Greg? Uh, we are good. All right, then we're going to start beginning our initial descent to our destination. Rule, suspect the worst. Are you saying we're about 100 miles out and we're going to start preparing the plane for landing? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay. We're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to police the cabin. We begin our initial descent. Rule, suspect the worst. He is a 63-year-old Indian male who is a long-standing glaucoma patient of mine who develops a sudden onset orbital pain of three days duration. Now he's diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, he's on Coumadin with a pacemaker, all kind of important parts of the story. He's got no vision change and he comes to me on a Monday as a walk-in emergency glaucoma evaluation because I'm his eye doctor. Now on Friday, he develops headache. Saturday, it gets worse. Sunday, it's really almost unbearable. He's gobbling analgesics and comes to me on Monday looking like this. And I can tell you this is all brand new. He has never looked like this before. And what we can see, there's a partial, there's a ptosis, not complete, but is a definite ptosis. And you can see his eye is a little bit down and out. When we lift his eyelid, he cannot look up, cannot look down. He can AB duct the eye, but he cannot AD duct the eye. So we're dealing with medial rectus, we're doing inferior rectus, superior rectus. Uh, lateral rectus is all fine. And we take a look, he's got a five millimeter unresponsive pupil on the right side, a two millimeter responsive pupil on the left, and this is a pretty clear uh, diagnosis of a partial third nerve palsy. So he's got a pupil involved third nerve palsy of at least three days duration. Now, 
most likely cause is an intracranial aneurysm. This is really probably the biggest ocular emergencies that optometrists and ophthalmologists will face. The intracranial aneurysm causing third nerve palsy. This was a very quick examination. The examination probably lasted about 10 minutes. Most of the time I was spent in talking to the patient and his wife. Now this is a patient I sent right to the emergency department. And if you're inclined to call an ambulance for a person like this, go right ahead. It gets them there quicker. It gets them triaged faster. And if they start to rupture and bleed, they can be stabilized. Now, basically the information is, patient has a right pupil involved third nerve palsy, suspect aneurysm of posterior communicating artery, Patient needs neurosurgical consult stat. And as I was talking about this, I could see his wife was getting anxious. And I knew she was about that. I knew the question that she was going to ask, and, and she did. She said, how much is this all going to cost? We don't have insurance. My response, it doesn't matter. She's going to die. If you take him home, he'll lie down, he'll become comatose, and he will die. You don't walk this one off. I offered an ambulance. They, they declined. She said, I will take him myself. I gave my cell phone number. 45 minutes later, I got a call. He was in a CT scanner at the hospital already within 45 minutes. He had an intracranial aneurysm that was beginning to leak. He was hospitalized for 23 days. They did two endovascular coil packing of the aneurysm and he ultimately lived. Now, he was on Coumadin. If he bleeds, he's not, gonna stop, he's not gonna stop bleeding. He has a pacemaker. He can't have an MRI. These are all very important considerations here. And this is what he looks like now. You know, he, his, his lid is almost completely regenerated. He has a Barrett regeneration with a pseudo von Graefe sign. His motility did not improve at all. And I can, Greg, I can tell you, if he walked into your office without telling you my name and this history, you're, you're going to react because he's got a partial ptosis. He cannot AD duct, he cannot elevate, he cannot depress his eye and his pupil is fixed and dilated. That is a third nerve palsy. The only difference is he has been treated as well as he can be treated. That, that aneurysm has been packed with these inner, inner coils and the chance of rupture is actually very, very, very small at this point. But he walks around. He, he, he looks like a third. I mean, he has got a third nerve palsy. It just has not recovered any better than that. So Joe, we have a rule breaker, but I think that goes to the very beginning where I always mm -hmm. butcher up the name. You know, where it says ex exceptions to the rules and exceptions to the exceptions to the rules. Mm -hmm. There is someone that put in the private chat that it says rule breaker. Uh, here is a case where you didn't have three days. Indeed. Well, I actually did have three days. I mean, it, it happened over three days. And you're right. This, this is one of those things we have to be aggressive at. So what? in every rule, there, there are exceptions to the rule. What is the procedure endovascular coils, question mark? That's a great question. I've got a graphic on that. I'll, I'll, I'll get that in just a few moments. I'm going to defer on that right now. So what is this? It's an eye that's down and out with a ptosis. There's an adduction, elevation, depression, deficits. And it could be isochoric or anisochoric. Now, Greg, and to the audience. Every now and then, some, the, a patient will do something really, really nasty to you. And what I'm going to say is, you don't have an eye that's down and out, you have an eye that's up and out. And it's a third nerve palsy. And every now and then, you'll have a patient who, act, has, got, who has got a paretic eye, but their other eye can't see. And I had a patient like this very recently uh, with another cranial neuropathy. They fixated with their paretic eye. So the eye that's down and out now gets moved into the position because the other eye can't see. Their, their 
un uninvolved eye goes up and out. So when a patient fixates with a parotid eye, it gets very confusing. Here's a patient who has got a complete third nerve palsy. There's a complete ptosis. He is actually uh, a very bad diabetic. I think his blood sugar was in the 300s. His A1C was around 11. And we can see amongst the dermatochelasis, there's a ptosis. When we lift his eye, he cannot look up. He cannot look down. He cannot AD duct. He's got a horrible vasculopathy going on, the diabetes. His pupils are symmetrical and reactive. Now, this is a person who, before I saw him on the follow-up, was actually imaged and was imaged through his primary care physician. And the only thing I can imagine is the primary care physician got inundated with information by one of our clinicians. And they they rightfully wanted to rule out aneurysm. But they probably mentioned to the internist that the patient has bad diabetes and this is probably ischemic. Well, that's a word the internist knew. And that's the word the internist hooked up on. So this is a person who got imaged with an MRI, which is the wrong test, but he got an MRI. And I looked at the report and the indication for imaging was brain ischemia. That's not how we do this. You need to tell them to look for an aneurysm. And you can't use a CT or MRI. You have to use a CTA or an MRA because if you're looking for an A aneurysm, you need an A in the test, either CTA or MRA. Now, the people with motor fibers coat the third nerve, so they're very vulnerable to compression from outside. Typically, it's the posterior communicating artery because the vessel and the nerve run in parallel. So when the, there's compression from the outside, the third nerve is affected, the motility is affected, the lid is affected, and the pupil and motor fibers are also affected, thus the dilated pupil. Now, in ischemic vasculopathy is hypertension and diabetes. There is an infarct of the vasovisorum. The core of the nerve stops working, but there's a rich, anastomotic blood flow to the, to, the, to the nerve and the pupil and motor fibers are still nourished. The pupil is normal. Now, anatomy is very important. If the vessel and the nerve are relatively far apart, it's going to take a big aneurysm to cause compression. But if anatomically in any patient, the nerve and the vessel are close together, a relatively small aneurysm can cause compression and can be missed on imaging. Pupil involved third nerve palsies are aneurysms until proven otherwise. Now, an incomplete palsy is also an aneurysm to, until proven otherwise, regardless of the pupil. And here's a nice example here's a woman who's got a little ptosis can look up, but not completely, can probably look down, but not completely, a little bit of an adduction deficit. There's still motility there. There's still lid there. It's incomplete. Likely that's an expanding aneurysm. So partial or incomplete palsies are going to be burgeoning aneurysms that are just expanding, regardless of the pupil. Now, you're never going to have a dilated pupil alone from an aneurysm. Doesn't happen. You have motility deficits, you'll have lid deficits, but not just an isolated dilated pupil. 30% of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. Now, I want to qualify this. I don't want you thinking that every time you see a third nerve palsy, there's a one in three chance it's an aneurysm. It's not necessarily true. It all depends on the patient profile. There are some patients who may have a 5% chance of an aneurysm. Another patient may have a 95% chance of an aneurysm based upon the clinical findings. Just a third or aneurysmal doesn't mean that you've got a one in three chance. It might be more, it might be less. Pain is pain. It's only helpful when it's not, when, when it's not present. Aneurysms are always painful. They compress pain sense of dural structures, they leak and bleed to cause the meningeal irritation. 
Diabetes and hypertension are painful 90% of the time. So pain is only helpful if it's not there. If there's no pain, it's not likely to be an aneurysm. Vascular passive third nerve palsies will resolve in time, usually within 90 days, and they're significantly better within, within about six weeks, but aneurysms will likely rupture in time. 20% will die within 48 hours from, from rupture of the aneurysm. So the clock is against you. That's pretty darn significant. 20% will die within 48 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. They have subarachnoid subdural hematoma. The brain stem will herniate down through frame and magnum. It shuts off respiration. They have respiratory collapse. They die. Half these patients overall will die. Many will not make it to the hospital. 80% will, will, will rupture with, within a month. The average time from onset to rupture is 29 days. So maybe we have a few more days, but we don't want to delay our diagnosis here. Now, we talked about treatment. There are two treatments that are probably equally effective. One is intracranial surgery with a craniotomy. We actually go in and put an aneurysm clip on the, on the aneurysm like a, like a clip on a bag of potato chips. The other is endovascular coiling, where they actually go through the femoral or the radial artery. They'll snake a catheter up to the area. Sometimes if the, if the, if the artery is narrow, they'll put a stent in, just like they will in the heart, uh, heart vessels. And they'll squeeze these coils like toothpaste that will fill up the aneurysm. And it'll fill up and blood really can't get in there. If blood can't get in there, it's not likely to rupture. Now, both are equally effective. One, one is intracranial surgery, the other is endovascular. Both are pretty effective. And I used, I used to say that both, both techniques are pretty, are, you know, are, are pretty simple in the hands of a skilled neurosurgeon. And then uh, some time ago, I had a retired neurosurgeon and we were talking about this. So I asked her, said, you know, what, what are your thoughts? She said, yeah, we, we, yeah, people just, uh, just do endovascular. They, they do coils. So no, nobody does, nobody does aneurysm, aneurysm clips anymore. She said, she said, it's not really pleasant. She said, you, you open up the door and it's just all bloody. You can't see what you're doing. And most of the time we start doing something, it bursts all over you. And now you got, now you got to deal with it. So it's just not pleasant. So most everybody is doing the endovascular coiling at this point. Here's a rule, never dilate a patient with third nerve palsy. You can take a look, do an undilated look, do your optos, your clarus, do your, do your photograph, don't dilate. And the reason is somebody's gonna have to look at that pupil. Somebody downstream's gonna have to look at it. And if you dilate them, it just makes the diagnosis harder for people. Now, imaging. CT and CT angiography is actually the best non-invasive imaging for, for third nerve palsy. Now, digital subtraction angiography done in the hospital is a gold standard. But CTA and, is, CTA is great for subarachnoid hemorrhage. CTA is excellent for identifying the aneurysm. Now, CT angiography does require contrast and if they have uh, renal imp impairment, MRI and MRA is gonna be better. CTA is better if they can't have an MRI for you know, claustrophobia or pacemaker. MRI is better if you're wrong, it's not an aneurysm. MRA adds very little time, but you need a CTA or an MRA somewhere in there. If you're looking for an aneurysm, you need something that is looking, you know, looking at the vessels. There's CT angiography or a magnetic resonance angiography. And this is what you need to tell the emergency room physicians to you know, what to look for and how to do it. Now here's a different patient with a different prognosis. 63 year old female, diabetic and hypertensive. She develops a sudden onset retroorbital pain. That's what, what I, it just impresses me. It's not the fact that she can't open her eyelid. It's not that she sees double if she lifts up her eyelid, she has pain. She's a poorly controlled diabetic and hypertensive patient. She's got a complete palsy. When I lift up the eyelid, she can't look up. She can't look down. She can AD duct. She can't A, she can AB duct. She can't AD duct. 
So we've got a complete third neuropology with pupil sparing and vascogenic risk factors in an older person, which is better, one or two. She resolved completely over several weeks with no sequelae. He was hospitalized 23 days, two neurosurgical procedures, but he at least did live. Suspect the worst. I was talking about this at a live meeting out west one time, and an optometrist in the audience, I think very bravely, shared a case where they saw a third nerve palsy in their practice. I don't know the status of the pupil, but they referred to an ophthalmologist the next day. Unfortunately, the patient died overnight from a subarachnoid hemorrhage because it was aneurysm. Now, do vasculopathic risk factors help me make my decision? Well, sort of. I mean, arteriosclerotic risk factors in an older person does favor a microvascular etiology, but you know, hypertension and diabetes and hypercholesterol, they don't protect against an aneurysm. So I get very nervous when they're not there. Now, what is the threat assessment here? An isolated dilated pupil is at no risk for an aneurysm. A complete third nerve palsy with a normal pupil in an older person with ischemic vascular disease is a low risk for an aneurysm. A partial third of the normal pupil is a high risk for an aneurysm. And a pupil involved third is an emergency. You're never out of the woods. Patient had a third nerve palsy for an aneurysm. Was successfully treated with an aneurysm clip. This is several years ago. Now, all those coils are, are in their MRI safe, but not all aneurysm clips at the time were MRI safe. Our radiologic tech didn't verify what type of clip was used. Underwent a follow-up MRI in a, in a major Texas facility with a non-MRI safe aneurysm clip in place. It displaced during the MRI, the patient died. The patient had a fatal hemorrhage. Survived the disease, killed by the follow-up. Greg, I'm going to skip polling question number five. I'm going to wrap up. We're about to touch down. I'm going to leave you with my O2 a third nerve. Are you saying that our uh, trays are in the upright position? Our seat backs are up and Wi Fi is turning off at 10,000 feet? Oh, no. Our, our landing gear is down. We're just about to touch. All right. When the eye is down and out with ptosis, you better hope for meiosis. If the palsy is total with people sparing in an oldie, it's vascular and not too daring. A partial palsy calls for double duty because it's probably an aneurysm going through puberty. But the pupil is dilated and the aneurysm is violated. No time for deferral and no time for referral. Sent to the ER without debate, because remember, 20% will die within the first 48. And with that, we have just touched down and we're going to taxi into our gate on time. So Greg, I'm going to turn it back over to any questions and back over to you to finish up our housekeeping. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything uh, in the questions. I get thanks, Joe. Great as always. Um, I did ask a little bit earlier, Joe, about, uh, um, about the eight o'clock start. They seem to have liked that. So we're good that way. So very good. I'm going to stop my sharing, Greg, and let you take it on over. Yep, I got it. Uh, thanks, Joe, for doing this. And thanks, everyone, for attending Rules and Exceptions to the Rules in Neuroptomic Disease. This was an interactive distance learning course. It's being concluded. Uh, we have Joe as our speaker. I was host, and I have to correct that, but we had Vanessa here as our conference administrator. Thanks, Joe. Hi, you're welcome, Greg.